Viewfinder is also supported by the expanded Jackson Rancheria Casino and Hotel. An hour's drive from Sacramento, Jackson Rancheria offers gaming, entertainment, fine dining, rooms and suites, and a conference center. Jackson Rancheria Casino and Hotel, where friendship is the largest jackpot. As an ad agency familiar with fast pitches and screwballs, Seraph and Ben is pleased to support the Golden Game. It draws us in at a young age. The exact details of our first hit, strikeout, and home run are often forgotten. But people rarely forget how they felt playing the game. For more than 150 years, generations have grown up playing it. Parents watch their children play and learn the lessons of a game filled with dramatic highs and crushing lows. Big games are won and lost, and dreams to play at the highest levels are pursued and abandoned. But what transcends it all is often a lifetime love for a game we all consider our own. The game is baseball. The Sacramento Baseball Club the Altas, the Gilt Edge, the Senators, the Solons, and River Cats. From pro ball to little league, there's been a rich history of the game in Sacramento, enough to fill volumes. Here, we tell just some of the stories of a city and its love of baseball. The relationship between Sacramento and baseball runs deep, but few realize the city's connection to the sport stretches all the way to New York and the father of the game. Well, what's intriguing about baseball in California is that it shows up uh, when the state itself is being formed in the gold rush. Uh, Alexander Cartwright, uh, uh, who if you look at his plaque in the Hall of Fame in New York, is described as the father of baseball. Well, he was a 49er. And what distinguished him, uh, as opposed to other 49ers, is that he carried a satchel, and in that satchel was a baseball. Supposedly, um, he organized baseball games along the way uh, amongst the young men on the wagon train whenever they would make stops. Did he, the father of baseball, bring that baseball out of his satchel and start tossing around with people at the time? And was that the origins of, of baseball in California? Proof could be here. Cartwright did visit Sacramento, but there's no hard evidence. But buried in these articles of the old Sacramento Union, something equally impressive was discovered. The first baseball club on the West Coast was in Sacramento. It was the Sacramento Baseball Club, and it was organized in 1859. As far as I can tell, uh, this was the first announcement in a California newspaper of a baseball club being organized. The first West Coast game soon followed. Well, uh, February the 22nd, 1860, should be kind of a, an anniversary date uh, to note because that's when the first official game was played in Sacramento. It was because of my baseball research and finding out about these first games that led me to Sacramento's Old City Cemetery. N.B. Kendall played in Sacramento's very first baseball game and was around for another historic moment when the nation's first professional baseball team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, came through town. 1869 was a huge moment in not only in California history but in American history. It uh, was when the Transcontinental Railroad was linked together, uh, linking east and west. And six months after the uh, railroad was finished, uh, a baseball team came west, and that was the Cincinnati Red Stockings, who were the best baseball team on the planet. They were the first dream team, and they came out west to play uh, the local California teams. That game didn't go nine innings. The score was something like 50 to five after seven innings, and so they quit. But an interesting thing about that game is that one of the players 
was N.B. Kendall. So he kind of connects the very beginnings of baseball with the next phase of the game in Sacramento. And that next phase would be the creation of Sacramento's first professional team. Sacramento's first professional team was the 1886 Altas of the California League, and its first true ball field was Agriculture Park near H and 20th. But truth is, beer might have been bigger than the team. A lot of early baseball can be traced back to beer. You gotta remember that Sacramento was as hot as it is now, but there wasn't the air conditioning that we have now. Sacramento's second team, again, beer. The Gilt Edge, was named after a beer. That was Roost Dollar's uh, brewery. It was their top beer. And in 1898 through 1901, they were the Gilt Edge, also called the Brewers. Their second ballpark at S and 28th, whiskey. The Snowflake Park was, was named after a whiskey, the top whiskey produced by the local haulers company. People talk about downtown baseball parks as if baseball parks historically were always downtown. They weren't. One of the early figures in Sacramento baseball was Edward Cripp. He was associated with the Buffalo Brewing Company. When the Pacific Coast League was formed, he was the one that was responsible for building the ballpark at Riverside and Broadway. He picked the location at Riverside and Broadway because it was just outside the city limits. Edward Cripp didn't want to have to deal with the Sacramento Police Department in connection with this new ballpark he was building. The featured attraction was Buffalo beer. Beer played a big part in the early history of Sacramento baseball. Beer got the game started, but 1903 was the year it began to stand on its own. That year, the new Sacramento Senators beat the Oakland Oaks in what would be the first game of the Pacific Coast League. Uh, the Pacific Coast League uh, then begins a, a marvelous uh, history with uh, just fabulous names, Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, just a, a galaxy of talent who, who came through the Coast League to ultimately play in Major League Baseball. One thing people have to remember is that uh, there, were no, there were no major leagues in California in 1903. All the major leagues were in the East Coast. California was sort of a, a distant planet, uh, far away from the orbit of uh, the major league cities. The Pacific Coast League was the center of that universe. And the play, as it evolved over the years, it was considered to be a third major league. For the next six decades, the PCL was West Coast baseball. From 1918 through 1960, baseball would be played at the corner of Riverside and Broadway in that great park with many names. It was once Buffalo Park, after, of course, beer, then Mooring, after team owner Lou Mooring, Cardinal, when they became a St. Louis affiliate, Doubleday, when St. Louis abandoned the team, and finally Edmondsfield, or Dick Edmonds, the sports writer who successfully lobbied to keep the team in town in 1944. Along the way, the team also took the name that at first no one understands. A Solon is a legislator, and since this was the capital city, and originally when we came into the Pacific Coast League, we were called the Senators, they would occasionally call us the Solons. The name stuck, and players wearing that uniform would usher in changes that at times were felt far beyond the stadium walls. You can tell the story of baseball, and it's often the story of America. By the 1930s, changes were coming for our nation, and those playing baseball would routinely lead the way. Even in the midst of the Depression, America was in a whirlwind of technological change. The first television broadcasts began in the 1930s, and in Sacramento, another illuminating event was about to take place, the very first night game on the West Coast. And it was a really big deal because there had only been uh, one or two night games uh, played in the entire United States. It was a July date in 1930, six years before the major leagues had baseball at Crosley Field, Cincinnati Reds. And it's now a commonplace that there's night baseball. But in 1930, it was, it was considered a daft idea. Uh, play baseball at night? What are you, nuts? 
The 30s would be a time of more than just technological change. In 1936, Jesse Owen shattered racial barriers halfway around the globe, and in Sacramento, cultural history was being made through baseball. Kenzo Nishida was a Japanese American who played for the Sacramento uh, Solons in 1932. He was uh, a hero to many Japanese Americans of that time because uh, here he was, uh, uh, second generation Japanese and son of immigrants uh, who was playing America's game. It was important. So this was a, a way that uh, all these people became part of American life. And the Coast League was, was that first uh, gateway. Coming with Jackie Robinson in the 1940s, beginning with then, uh, the, the racial makeup of baseball begins to change. But in Sacramento, we first broke the color line, if you will, in 1950 when two players came to Sacramento from Venezuela. Uh, Walter McCoy and, and Margaret Williams. Well, again, that's a reflection of our society, our openness as a, as a people. There's lots of different people who live here, and there are lots of different people who play baseball, and it's one of the ways we uh, come together as a people. And Sacramento fans have come together over the years to see a diversity of talent. But will today's fan remember yesterday's greats? been a lot of baseball players that have gone on to achieve great things from Sacramento. George Borchers was Sacramento's first contribution to the major leagues with what would become eventually the Chicago Cubs. Stan Hack is, is actually a baseball legend. Uh, probably the most notable infielder who ever played the game here in Sacramento. He played for the Chicago Cubs for 16 seasons and is really regarded as one of the best third basemen of the 1930s. Joe Marty is, uh, has been described by older sports writers as probably one of the finest ball players to come out of Sacramento. He attended Christian Brothers High School and was a sports star there, went out of St. Mary's and was a sports star. And after that, he went up and played for the Chicago Cubs, becoming the first Sacramentan to hit a home run in the World Series. And there's at least one Solon's broadcaster who shouldn't be forgotten. Tony Kester was the voice of the Solons. He would go to road games in the Bay Area, he would broadcast local games, but those road games uh, were very interesting to a lot of people because what he would do is actually recreate them. It was no secret to them that he wasn't watching the game because they could see him reading the information off of a ticker tape. Um, he would make you know, the sound of the bat by banging two pieces of wood together. He had some background noise for uh, uh, various crowd actions. When he would announce a pitch, he'd slap the side of his leg. He'd say, here comes the wind-up, the pitch, ball one. I think that was more exciting to them than watching the game itself. But there was one pitcher everyone had to see in person, possibly Sacramento's greatest ever. What made Tony Frey's great? He was dependable, and I think that as a role model, he was outstanding. Well, Tony Freitas was, was a guy that just felt like he could do anything. He pitched a 17 and two-thirds inning game against Dizzy Dean. There are pitchers that don't pitch 17 and two-thirds innings in a month or two months' time, and he did that in one day. Tony Freitas played with the Sacramento Solons for 16 years. In six of those years, he had more than 20 wins. As I understand it, uh, 45 uh, shutouts. He was small in stature, but big in heart and big in desire. Beyond that, there's a picture of him, and he's, he, he's not much bigger than I am, but he's holding seven baseballs in his hand. A classic PCL player, you can't help but wonder how good Freitas would have been in today's game. And while he played only a few short years in the majors, he's still known as the winningest left-hander in minor league history. It's a shame that memory is so short. There are a lot of people who I am afraid are just gonna be forgotten in history unless we keep talking about them and what they've done. Tony Freitas is one of those people. He was still the most personable guy even in his 70s when he would meet kids and visit with kids. There was more to him and more to his life than baseball. Uh, it was a, a lot more. He had um, an incredible, kind, uh, loving, 
dedicated attitude. And that's what, I'll, that's what I miss, just that time with him. For more than 20 years, Freitas was Sacramento's biggest sports star, and he would be the key component to Sacramento's biggest and most dramatic series. By the early 1940s, the Solons had become a farm club of Branch Rickey's St. Louis Cardinals, and for the first time in a long time, winning seemed possible. The Sacramento baseball team had never won a pennant since 1903 when the league was created. So going into the 1942 season, we were looking to finally win a Pacific Coast League championship. But then history got in the way. So between the 1941 and 1942 seasons, what happened? Pearl Harbor and war broke out. There was some question as to whether they would even play the 1942 season. In President Roosevelt's famous letter to Commissioner Landis, he said the game must go on, but for whom? You couldn't come out to the park if you didn't have gasoline in your tank, and everybody was on rationing. The rationing stamps that everybody had were Class A's. This is almost a year after Pearl Harbor. You have a lot of upheaval because, you know, we were not winning the war then. That was a, that was a comeback year for us. And while they lost many players to the draft, the Solons played on. And near the end of the season, were in second place, trailing William Wrigley's powerhouse Los Angeles Angels. Well, the idea of small market teams versus big market teams is not a new one. Uh, you had Sacramento competing against the likes of the Wrigley family in Los Angeles, the Wrigley gum, chewing gum empire. They had lots of money. He had the best of talent that money could buy. That was the way he worked. And it just so happened the last series of the year would be against the Angels. Sacramento would need a near flawless series to be PCL champs. Well, the 1942 baseball season in the Pacific Coast League was pretty much a done deal for the Los Angeles Angels. It was a seven-game series. To make it more exciting, Sacramento loses the first two games of the series. It then comes down to five games. They're four games behind, which means in order to win the pennant, the Solons have to win all five of the last games. Remarkably, Sacramento wins the next three. They almost blew it on Saturday. It went 11 innings. In the top of the 11th, the Angels go ahead by one run. And then comes Gene Lillard to the bat in the bottom of the 11th, and it's a two-run homer. The Solons win the Saturday game. The season and the championship rested on a Sunday doubleheader and Sacramento had to win both. And for that one day, the city would take time out from the world and its troubles. In a ballpark that was drawing five to 600 people the rest of the season, they draw 11,000 plus fans to a park that'll only hold 10,000. It was an escape for people. Escape what the war was inevitably dragging us in. And to think that your team, the Solons, had come out of nowhere to challenge the mighty Los Angeles Angels, this was great, this was great. After dramatically winning the first game, the Solons had no choice but to turn to their MVP. Tony Freitas had pitched the game on Friday. He had closed the first game on Sunday. Pepper Martin looked around and was trying to figure out who was going to pitch, and Tony said, I'm, I'm still warm. Let, put me back in. So yours truly was appointed to pitch that ball game, and as luck would have it, they were lambs. They were a beaten ball club, and I had no trouble with them, and we went on to beat them 5-1 to one and get Sacramento's only pennants. Uh, they were entered in the Coast League 39 years ago. You, you couldn't write uh, fiction better than that. You've seen movies about these come-from-behind victories and you've never seen anything more exciting than that. Truth is better than fiction. But the good times wouldn't last. By 1943, the war effort had decimated the Solons. Most of the good players were sent other places or were lost to the draft. 
So the 1943 Solons uh, were a complete turnaround for the 1942 season. We won the championship in 42, and in 1943, we set the record for the worst league ever in the Pacific Coast League. And when I saw as few as 200 fans in Edmonds Field watching a ball game, a Coast League ball game, I knew that there was some bad days ahead. But the worst was yet to come. Well, that was a sad day in Sacramento. Uh, when Edmonds Field burned in, in July of 1948, I, I still have people coming up to me and saying that they remember standing out in front of their house and watching the smoke and the, and the, and the flames from that, the field burning down. The team hadn't been performing well, either on the field or financially, and before the embers cooled, rumors started to swirl. The conspiracy was that, that uh, the ball club was losing money. There was speculation that it might have been arson. There was a suggestion that uh, the team management had increased their insurance uh, just a few weeks before the fire. They moved it from 140 up to $250,000 insurance in case something happened. Well, something did happen. And there's still doubt about this fire. Today, most people discount the arson theory, believing it was simply an accident. But on the other hand, most people don't believe that the one person who claims to have accidentally started the fire could have possibly done it. Well, I, I'll make my public confession again. Uh, I was uh, smoking a cigarette, and drinking a beer, and watching the game. And when I went to grind out the cigarette, my shoe, instead of stamping it out, kicked it just enough so it fell down in a crack. And I could see, see this cigarette butt resting on a big 12 by 12 beam uh, surrounded by peanut shells. And I poured a little bit of uh, beer down. I thought maybe that'll put it out. And I have to admit, I didn't want to waste too much beer because beer costs 15 cents a bottle. And Stan likes to. Um, Stan is Stan. I, I've heard other people say that they're pretty sure Stan didn't start that fire. But you'll have to ask Stan that question. And the ground was plenty wet. There was no reason for the wood to have taken off by a cigarette that was smoldering down there. But why did Mr. Gilliam wait so many years to tell people his story? I wanted to wait for the statute of limitations to run out, I guess. No, I, I, uh, I, I really do think that I was the one who unwittingly burned the ballpark. A new stadium would soon be built concrete this time, but even bricks and mortar couldn't save the team in 1958 from the bigger threat to the West and the South. Uh, when the Giants came to San Francisco and the Dodgers came to Los Angeles, that marked the end of the Pacific Coast League as we knew it. As much as people loved baseball, we weren't a big enough market and didn't win enough ball games to keep the Solons in town after the 1960 season. Mm -hmm. So it was a sad day. Uh, a lot of people were quite sad to see the Solons leave. The Solons moved to Hawaii and eventually Colorado Springs, where they became the Sky Sox that still play to this day. And by 1964, the near 100-year history of professional baseball in Sacramento came to an end when Edmonds was demolished. I was very, very emotional in 1960. Well, when I go by the Target at Riverside and Broadway, I remember Edmonds Field. I'd been there a number of times to ball games and other events, and I, I always get a bit nostalgic. I think back over times that, that, I, that I'd heard about when you know, Joe DiMaggio hit home runs there, Babe Ruth did. I don't buy that much from Target. <laughs> I kind of resent that they took away my, my little uh, uh, s s game in the sun. For a brief time in the 70s, a new team took the Solon's name, but they too folded. Sacramentans would go 23 years before seeing another professional game. May 15, 2000 would be the next milestone for Sacramento baseball and opening day for the city's newest ballpark, Rayleigh Field. The Vancouver Canadians became the Sacramento River Cats, bringing their successes with them. But 
may be better than success on the field, they've made new fans and brought back those who've had their hearts broken before. What the presence of the River Cats reaffirms is that Sacramento is still a baseball town. And I think that the number one thing I enjoy is coming to the park, and the atmosphere here has been outstanding. I think the players really enjoy playing in front of 10 to 12,000 people daily, and uh, they're motivated to go out and play the game as hard as they can. And that motivation extends to their role in the community when the River Cats partnered to build Independence Field. To build a facility uh, that is dedicated to people with disabilities, providing them the opportunity to play baseball in an environment that, uh, that allows them to, to, to get around and be mobile. It's just a, it's a wonderful thing. And the thing that really got me was, was the family component. All of those things combined to, uh, in my mind, make it, make it the best sport that there is. On fields like Independence and ballparks across Sacramento, you can still see the inspiration behind the game Cartwright established and brought west. A game that's meant to be played and enjoyed simply for the pure fun of it. Baseball has its own rhythm, and I think that's what's uh, nice about it. Because there's nothing like being in Sacramento at night, and it's just a beautiful, refreshing time to be out there and yelling for your team, and that's what makes baseball such a game. Well, baseball is more than a game. It's, it's the culmination of hard work. It's, it's, it's competition at its finest. It's, it's a great game. I love baseball for lots of reasons, and one of them is that it's a bridge to the past. It links us with generations. I remember going to the games with my father. Baseball is a game that can bind fathers and their sons together. That's one of the things about baseball that keeps it alive. What I love about the game is the game itself. You know, there's nothing in the world like going to a ball game. The smell of hot dogs and the beer. The sound of the ball hitting the bat. Playing my first game in Wrigley Field, hitting a home run, first time at bat. And then you play the game, and you, you play it as well as you know how to play it. And that's what I love about baseball. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923. As an ad agency familiar with fast pitches and screwballs, Seraph and Ben is pleased to support the Golden Game. Funding for the Viewfinder series is provided by Allied Insurance. Life comes at you fast. Allied provides insurance for auto, home, business, and farm. Allied Insurance, a nationwide company on your side. Viewfinder is also supported by the expanded Jackson Rancheria Casino and Hotel. An hour's drive from Sacramento, Jackson Rancheria offers gaming, entertainment, fine dining, rooms and suites, and a conference center. Jackson Rancheria Casino and Hotel, where friendship is the largest jackpot.